But then sometimes we go to the barber shop and clip our ends, meaning to cut or to separate. The word left is an auto antonym. Is there any food left? Left here means remaining. Or you could say everyone left the party. And the word left there means to depart. So how does the word revolution fit into all this? First definition of revolution is a total and radical change. Most of the time when we say revolution, this is what we mean, a total and radical change. Uh, but the other definition is to return to a point that was previously occupied. When the earth makes a trip around the sun, we call that a revolution. And a revolution is marked by the Earth's return to its previous position. This is what makes revolution a contronym. How can a revolution be something totally new and different on one end, and at the same time mean to go back to the place that you've been before? I struggled with this for a while until I heard the Lord say something. Revolution means in the spirit to do something radically different so that we can get back to where we used to be. I told the Lord, he said, back to the glory. Back to the place where we would worship until smoke filled the temple. It was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Uh, Ebony and I cousin Chris. We know each other from the City of Love. Um, and I have a lot of responsibilities in the City of Love. You heard her mention some of them. Uh, my wife and I, we teach, uh, or when we gather physically, we teach Bible study together on Wednesday nights, or playing alongside our pastor of music, Josh, or managing the pulpit. But some of the things that I do, uh, if I didn't tell you I did them, you would never know. Uh, it's a lot of behind-the-scenes work. And one of those things is uh, a strategist. It's developing, implementing, and executing strategies, marketing strategies, and communication strategies, social media strategies, you name it. And anyone who's ever worked in strategy or strategic planning knows this. You start with the goal. What are you trying to accomplish? And then you work backwards. From there, you create little goals that will lead you to the big goal. Uh, but there's one strategic part of planning that is key, and that is the word audit. Audit. Every now and then, you have to step back and make sure that the plan that you have set out is still working towards your goal. And if the methods, I'm going somewhere, if the methods are no longer working, you need to adjust them so that you can meet your goal. All right, here's the issue. In the New Testament, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, and Jesus, they both have the same goal. Their goal is to see the glory. The goal is to get back to the Father. The goal is to get back, back to the place where the glory would meet us on a consistent basis. So the religious folks, they have a good goal. The issue is they never did an audit to see if their methods were still working. That's good. And so their goals are admirable, but their methods became outdated. So people in your life who have some admirable goals, but they are using the same methods that their great, great, great grandparents use. And they're not necessarily bad people, but they are in need of an audit, and auditing is a painful process. To look at yourself and say, you might be wrong about this, is challenging to our egos. To look at situations in your life that are painful and ask, what part did I play in this, is amazingly difficult. When Jesus says in Luke 6, 42, he says, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck that is in your eye when you do not see the law that is in your own eye. He was saying we need to be introspective and self-reflective. But he was not talking to 
the religious people when he said that. He wasn't talking to the sinners when he said that. The Bible lets us know in verse 20, he was talking to his disciples. He was talking to us. So Jesus steps on the scene to let them know. Your goals are good. But your methods have become outdated and ineffective. That's the problem, church. We've gotten too comfortable with our systems and the methods that we use that we don't want to challenge them even when they're not effective. But if we want to see growth, we have to be willing to admit where we're wrong. If the goal is to see Jesus and our methods aren't yielding those results, there's not something wrong with Jesus, there's something wrong with our methods. That's what God is doing in this season. He's asking, where are the people who are desperate and hungry for my presence? Whether or not you sing my song, whether or not I like the preacher, whether or not I, they say something that I'm going to get a house or get a car or get a husband, it don't matter to me. We have to get back to the place where we say, I don't care what the method is as long as I get to have an experience with Jesus. Luke chapter 13 verses 10 through 13. I'm going to do something that I don't usually do. I'm going to preach out of the message Bible. Luke 13 10 through 13 says this. He, Jesus was teaching in one of the meeting places on the Sabbath. There was a woman present so twisted and bent over with arthritis that she couldn't even look up. She had been afflicted with this for 18 years. When Jesus saw her, he called her over. Woman, you're free. He laid hands on her and suddenly she was standing straight and tall and giving God the glory. The goal is the same, to give glory to God so he can reveal his glory to us. But look at what happens in verse 14. The meeting place president, furious because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the congregation, six days have been defined as work. Come on one of the six if you want to be healed, but not on the Sabbath. Not on the Sabbath. The religious people said, wait a minute. If you want to heal, that's no problem. But you have to heal Jesus according to our methods that we established back all the way back in Leviticus. They have not examined their methods all the way since Leviticus, thousands of years. Isn't it amazing how people will try to stop you from doing what they can't do? Verse 15, it says this, but Jesus shot back, you frogs! Each Sabbath, every one of you regularly unties your cow or donkey from its stall, leads it out for water, and thinks nothing of it. So why isn't it all right for me to untie this daughter of Abraham and lead her from the stall where Satan has had her tied these 18 years. Jesus said, hold up. I just did the same thing that y'all do. I just updated the method. You all untie your animals on the Sabbath. I untied a woman from the hands of Satan. What's the difference? And look at, look at what happened in verse 17. Look, it says, when he put it this way, his critics were left looking quite silly and red-faced. The congregation was delighted and cheered him on. Two things happened. The first thing is, her, his critics were left looking dumb. The Lord says that he's about to silence all of your critics and leave them looking foolish. And the second thing that happened is the congregation cheered him on because they were hungry for a revolution. They were in need of something different. Jesus comes in and says, keep the goal the same. But he says, your methods are in need of a change. Yes. Think about this. Think about this. Think about this. Think about what MP3s did to the music industry. When's the last time you bought a CD? No one asks if their favorite song is available in a record store. They all ask, is it on iTunes? Is it on... Google Play. The goal is still the same, to get people to listen to your music, but the method of delivery has changed. And MP3 single-handedly and successfully toppled 
the music industry. Netflix did it. My wife and I don't even have cable or satellite in our house. We got rid of it. What, what you need it for? Get you a good Apple TV, some Netflix, Hulu, maybe Amazon Prime, a little YouTube, you all right. So now we have an entire generation of cable cutters. People who have decided that the expense of cable is not worth the investment. The goal is still the same, to get people to watch TV. But the method has been updated. And if DirecTV and Cox Cable don't listen, they'll go the way of Blockbuster. Airbnb did it to the hotel industry. Big hotel chains was charging exorbitant fees and offering terrible customer service. Not this hotel, though. We love this hotel. Airbnb said you can stay in a nice, comfortable place at a much cheaper cost. The goal is the same. For people to have a place to stay when they go out of town. But the method has changed. And now the entire hospitality industry is fighting to make Airbnbs illegal. People who study these phenomena call it disruption. Disruptors come here, doesn't catch it, gets left behind. They, this is some technical words, they enter the market at the low end, at the, at the end of obscurity. But when they bust on the scene, everything changes. Did you know, did you know that Jesus is a disruptor? Yeah. He entered the market at the low end. He wasn't delivered in a palace with Herod and Caesar. He entered the market at the bottom through the womb of an unknown Jewish woman in a stable in Bethlehem. He had to go through 30 years of obscurity before he entered the scene as a rabbi. He didn't have no credentials. He didn't have any titles. He didn't have a collar. He didn't have any recognition from the establishment. The only thing he had was a word from his father. And what did he do when he came on the scene? He disrupted because the basis for any revolution must be disruption. You can't shake things up if you don't shake things up. Let me say it again. You can't shake things up if you don't shake things up. He did crazy things like announcing good news to the poor and hanging out with tax collectors and sinners and hanging out uh, with people that everybody else has gotten rid of. And he sought out and he saved the lost and he proclaimed that the last will be first and the first will be last. Listen, everywhere Jesus shows up, you can expect there to be a disruption. In Jesus' own words in Luke 12, he says this in verse 49, I have come to start a fire on this earth. How I wish it were blazing right now. I've come to change everything. Turn everything right. Turn everything right side up. How long for it to be finished? Do you think, listen to Jesus, do you think I came to smooth things over and make everything nice? Not so, he says. I've come to disrupt and confront. Listen, you better watch what you pray for in this season. Uh, because when you ask for the Lord to come into a situation, you may think that he's going to come in there and smooth things over and make everything nice. But he's saying, when I come into a situation, I've come to disrupt and confront. I love this Jesus. This Jesus ain't no pushover. He ain't no crying soft Jesus. Jesus said, I come to start a fire on the earth. And when Jesus speaks, it causes a fire to blaze. But listen, fire is not selective in what it burns. It consumes everything. And if fire is a symbol of passion, that's what it really means, Jesus. He's speaking those, he's speaking that to those who will hear and receive. It will be consumed with passion. But it also means that those who hear it and reject it will be consumed with passion against it. Let me say it like this. Stop being surprised and offended by the people who are against you. It's because when you are walking and talking in everything that the Lord has for you, it causes people to be consumed with passion against you. This is the price of disruption. 
person. It makes people uneasy and uncomfortable for when they lash out. But Jesus has words for them too. In Luke 12, 54, he says, Then he turned to the crowd and said, When you see crowds coming in from the west, you say, Storms coming in your right. When the wind comes out the south, you say, This will be a hot one in your right, you frauds. You know how to tell a change in the weather. So don't tell me you can sense a change in the season. This God season that we're in right now. I've never heard Jesus talking like this, but he's so serious. He says, don't tell me you can't feel what's going on right now. Don't tell me. Uh, maybe it's not. Has anybody been feeling a shift in the season? There's a, there's a shift going on. Let me tell you what's happening. Jesus is speaking. The divine is interacting with the earth and it's the beginning of a great awakening. I'm reminded of Ezekiel 37 1 and 2. He says uh, God grabbed me. God's spirit took me up and set me down in the middle of an open plain strewn with bones. He led me around them a lot of bones. Uh, there were bones all over the plain. Dry bones bleached by the sun. Somebody in here, your life, your finances, your relationships are like these bones. They're dry. They're stagnant. They've been sitting. They've been bleached by the sun, which means that they've been sitting for a long time. But they're at peace and they're comfortable. Then the divine starts to interact with the dead in Ezekiel 37, 7. I prophesied just as I've been commanded. As I prophesied, there was a sound and a rustling. And the bones moved and started coming together, bone to bone. Now, this is why people get mad when Jesus speaks in disruptive ways. Because they've been living in dead situations, but at least they're comfortable. They're together for you. Uh, just like those bones in the valley. Uh, the things that have been dead and stagnant and dying and bleached by inactivity, God is about to speak into them and they're about to start coming together. Every situation that feels dead and lifeless and helpless and hopeless, God says uh, it's about to start coming, uh, coming together. But it doesn't come together until Yes, sir. 
think that that's the damage they, and there's an earthquake. But then the earthquake has what's called aftershocks. Then for days later, you get little aftershocks. Aftershocks. Have you ever been going through something? Something happens and you go, oh, Lord, that's so much. But you know what? I'll be okay. And then after that car breaks down, the refrigerator goes out. And then after the refrigerator goes out, then the AC stops working. That's the aftershocks of the earthquake. It is meant to get you to give up. It is meant to get you, if the enemy had his way, to throw in the towel. That's, that's one thing that could happen as a result. If you can press through, if you cannot allow yourself to get so defeated and so distracted that you give up, tell me there's no glory on the other side. Amen. Thank you, God. The goal is still the same. Our goal is still the same. 